things apart from simply reduction on CO2, because that's where we need to be able to change these things. If we simply spend our time talking about reduction of CO2, and I know I've, I've talked about this a lot, a, a lot with Caroline over the years, is that if we only talk about CO2, for most people, that is something that is happening somewhere else to someone else. And they still need to be making sure that they can afford their bills and afford to be able to have a comfortable um, and affordable life and an interesting and and, uh, and, and uh, life in which they can fulfill their ambitions for themselves and their children. While you've got people who increasingly cannot afford insurance on their homes or their businesses, um, for example, because of the risks of increased flooding, again, something that's happened not only in places like South Yorkshire, but Cumbria, Leeds, Manchester and elsewhere, we know we need to be making these things a reality for people now. And we therefore need to be thinking about this, not just in terms of CO2, but also health and well-being, as well as jobs and prosperity. So this enables us to have a conversation, particularly in the context of place and about local government, about transforming services as well as the economy. The point I make quite often when I'm talking to Chris Stark, for example, the chief executive of the um, Committee on Climate Change, is that it's all very well talking about more electric buses. But if an electric bus only appears once a day in the same way that the dirty bus used to, it isn't increasing the quality of the service here and now for people. And it's barely improving health either. Knocking out one dirty bus and replacing it with one clean one makes a big difference when you've got lots of buses somewhere like London where you don't have lots of um, public transport. Investing in public transport to be integrated, affordable, reliable, safe, secure and clean is really important. And thinking about how you make sure that your transformation isn't simply about knocking out the CO2, but providing better services in a way that meets the needs of your communities now is crucial. And definitely a way of building the public consent and support. Because right now, although people will say that the, what the government announced yesterday wasn't nearly enough, what is happening is the easy stuff. There's so much more to be done. I'd like to make one point, though, that was really disappointing about yesterday, and that's the um, that's the Treasury's review. The words I think that are worthwhile quoting are ones that we have to have real concern about. They It says in the review, seeking to pass the costs onto future taxpayers through borrowing would not be consistent with intergenerational fairness nor fiscal sustainability. This could also push up the economic cost of transition. This is literally the opposite of the situation when it comes to this. We paid off our war debt in 2006. This is literally the thing we should be spending money on to save money later and to pass on a livable world to the next generation. This isn't just about spending lots of taxpayers' money. It's about shaping and creating markets, making sure that there is both supply and demand and, and falling costs for consumers as well as opportunities for jobs. Ultimately, a just transition to the net to net zero means that we can align the two things that this government say that they are interested in um, into something which could be a national mission to level up and to tackle climate change. That should be the, strat the test for the strategy that was published yesterday. And it should be the test also of what all local governments does when they're looking at whether they are able to um, play their role as well successfully in achieving net zero in this country. Very much. Some great thoughts there to get us going. Let's now hear from Simon. Simon Hansen. Well, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, I also want to thank uh, the Centre for Progressive Policy for inviting me here today to discuss such an important topic. Um, and maybe I could start by saying I agree a lot with the point that Polly just made, that this is not just about delivering emissions-free services and creating a society where we are not relying on fossil fuels. It's ultimately about developing a much better society with healthier, better jobs, with uh, healthier and better services, a society where everyone can really flourish. And I think there is a huge risk in the climate crisis because there's this urgency. We really need to bring down the CO2 emissions. And because science is so very clear on what needs to happen, not just across the board, but also within different sectors, it's very tempting to devise our policies purely from what we learn, what we know, must happen and sometimes forget that in the short term there can be costs to what we're doing and those costs are not necessarily distributed evenly across different segments of society. 
Some people are more relying on their cars in their everyday lives than others. Some people, like Polly also mentioned, they maybe make a living by repairing cars. You know, lots of people will be asking themselves very relevant and natural questions. What does this mean for me? And therefore, I think this whole issue of making sure that this transition is not just quick and efficient in terms of bringing down emissions, but that ultimately it's just and that it creates a society that in both social and economic terms uh, is much more equitable. I think that's really essential. And the good news, the way I see it, um, and having worked with C40 cities, where I've worked with some of the biggest cities across the globe uh, for many years, the good news is that cities, this is really the strategy they're pursuing. Because they have very ambitious climate action plans and they're science-based climate action plans. But a 100% integrated aspect of those climate action plans is that the climate action is also equitable mm. and just uh, and that it creates cities that are much better places to live in. And I think one good example is the city of Seoul. Uh, following COVID-19 and lockdown, they've been asking themselves, like any other city administration, how do we bring back jobs? But how do we do it in a way so it also helps us deliver our climate goals? And they're really looking at the buildings. And that's for a good reason, because in, in many global north cities, buildings is really what um, constitutes between 60 and 70 percent of their in-city emissions. Mm. So buildings is essential. And what they're saying in Seoul is we have old municipal buildings. They're not performing very well in terms of energy efficiency. Why don't we take the first step as the municipal government and make sure that the buildings we own are retrofitted so they're much more energy efficient, making sure that the workers that are going to, to do those retrofits, that they are upskilled so that afterwards, when you see demand taking up in the private market, they can go out and deliver the services needed for green retrofits. And, and that program in itself will deliver 20,000 green jobs within just three years in Seoul. So a very efficient program. It's, it's in many ways the most efficient way to bring down emissions. It's upskilling a labor force uh, and it's creating better and greener jobs. And maybe to give one more example and my last example, um, we are also now seeing that many cities are looking at the way they are designed, the way they are, they are planning, um, and seeing how can they plan in a way so, so that they create uh, neighborhoods that are complete neighborhoods where all the essential things you need to, to live a good life in the city is not more than 15 minutes away by foot or bicycle. Uh, and that, of course, has a very important aspect in the climate crisis because it creates neighborhoods that are resilient. You're not so relying on transport to get what you need. And we've seen in COVID how important that is. But it also creates neighborhoods where uh, the people who are working in the corner shops or who are providing services for the elderly, basically every segment of society can find a place for them to, to, to live. And again, I think uh, a city like Paris is a great inspiration because for them, the 15 minute city strategy is not only about making sure there is access to green spaces or making sure there is access to education or the things you need. It's also really making sure there's access to affordable housing. So they don't have part of the city that are uh, effectively uh, not accessible for those who have normal incomes or, or low incomes. So I think those are two great examples of how cities are actually making a lot of progress this year in, in developing a, a, a green and just transition. So interesting. Lots and lots to jump off from there. And I think efficiency and resilience are going to be two ideas that we, we come back to. And they came up this morning. But before that, let's hear from Ryan Jude. Thanks. So on the finance side, I just want to take a step back first and talk about a few of the terminology points that people use when they talk about financing for just transition. I think it's very important to address this because how we talk about it informs what the public think. So firstly, we often hear, and I'm glad that Polly quoted the net zero review because it saves me having to do it here, but we often hear the spending being talked about as a challenge or a cost. And we're very keen to reframe that as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for finance to innovate, to invest in opportunities that are fit for our future economy, which is where the taxonomy comes into it. But it's also an opportunity to improve our health conditions, build these green jobs, cut inequality, redistribute the costs, and hopefully avert climate disaster. The second thing I want to say is that finance is innovating. So through things such as green finance and social finance, but again, on the terminology, if we achieve what we want to achieve, they're going to just become finance. Green jobs are just going to become jobs. The green economy will just be the economy because we need to do that to get to where we want to get to in the next few decades. Um, the third one terminology is on just transition itself. I think a lot of time people get hung up on slogans, 
And you've heard complaints about people where they say that just transition isn't in corporate plans, isn't in government plans. With the current UK government, for example, when they have their twin goals of net zero and leveling up, that's essentially just transition in another frame. We now just need the public spending to go alongside it, which we've touched on. I'll, I'll touch on a bit more later. So what is finance doing? So quickly on this, there's been a huge growth in recent years in the labeled bond market. So these are green bonds, social bonds, sustainability linked loans. Green bonds surpassed a trillion dollars in issuance last year. Social bonds, which are fairly new, hit $250 billion in issuance last year, which was a 10 times increase in the previous year. Um, what are these things though? So um, there's two types of labeled bonds, it's either use of proceeds where a green bond will raise finance and then put the money towards a green use of proceeds in, in accordance with a set of principles that the market's agreed upon. There's also the sustainability linked ones, which are key performance indicator linked. What that means is that a company, when they issue the debt, the financing of the debt will be linked to certain targets they've agreed in advance. So on the social side, this might be the number of jobs that that investment will create. And if they don't hit it in a certain amount of time, they feel that cost on their capital, on their balance sheet, which is, which is important. Um, there's been a big win with these sorts of things in, in recent years with the UK government's green guilt that came out this year. So this was the biggest green guilt at its time of issuance, but what didn't receive as much media attention is that they promised to also report on the social co-benefits. So that is the likes of jobs created and potentially leveling up. They haven't yet specified what the, what the KPIs will be. Um, this is something that we heavily work towards with the LC Grantham Institute, the Impact Investing Institute. So we were very happy to see this coming in. But once you start reporting on that is when Just Transition becomes embedded with the finance. We're also seeing more private finance companies incorporating Just Transition into their plans. Um, amongst all the policies that came out yesterday, the Greening Finance Roadmap on Monday may have been lost, but not for us at the Green Finance Institute. And in that, for the first time, they're going to be asking companies to specify their transition plans and to report against it, which again, is a huge step. And through that, hopefully we'll start seeing companies committing to job creation, other social KPIs. A crucial point here then is that people often talk about this as public finance versus private finance. The debate is you know, obviously more nuanced than just that binary. We need both, but we need them targeted at the right areas and supporting the right people. So private finance will end up picking up the majority of the funding that we need going forward but public finance needs to protect the most vulnerable. We can talk about the policies um, throughout the debate, but things such as carbon pricing and ring fencing the revenues to support those on the lowest income is crucial. And also funding for training, potentially transition wage subsidies, but we can talk about all that in the debate. But also where public financing is spent needs to be its most impactful. So this is through guarantees and grants where it's needed. Guarantees which will leverage the private finance and ensure that you're getting more bang for your buck when you're spending from the public purse. And we have the capacity to do this. The CCC has said that we should be spending 1% of GDP every year, but a recent study has shown that the UK Treasury's current plans are about 0.01%, which is massively under, undercut. I don't know what the update is after yesterday's, but I don't think it's gonna to change too much. And the cost of inaction is even greater, with predictions showing that we'll hit 20% of GDP if we don't spend today. So again, Polly quoted what the Net Zero Review said yesterday, and it talked about passing on intergenerational burdens. The biggest burden we can pass on is not spending and not acting now. Um, my very final point. So there's three pillars in the Just Transition financing discussion. There's corporates, governments, and local government. Touched on the first two. On local government, we also need them to innovate on their finance. We're seeing this through things such as local climate bonds, which is something that we're doing with support of Poly and UK 100, where councils issue crowdfunded debt from people who live in their local area. What this means is that the people who are more affluent can put their savings into the bond, and then the council spends it in the area, and then it becomes a public good, and it benefits everyone that lives in the area. So that's a great way to redistribute who is shouldering the burden. Um, so I'll leave it there. Many points there. Terminology bugbears. Private finance <laughs> is innovating. Public finance needs to increase with targeted spending, and local councils need to do some work as well. Loads to talk about. I should add, actually, the Treasury also did acknowledge yesterday, didn't they, that uh, the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action, which I think many people thought was uh, was an interesting move forward for, for the Treasury. Caroline, over to you. Um, thanks very much. Um, as you said, I've been co-chairing a project for Onward This last year on called Getting to Zero. And our project particularly wanted to look at um, the scope for change, but also looking in more detail at those communities who could be more adversely affected by uh, the journey we're on. 
if there isn't mitigation, but also the realisation of opportunities as well to replace jobs that inevitably are bound to go. And uh, we've done four reports. Uh, the first report, getting to zero, was looking at those most affected. We then looked at greening the giants, or as I like to call it, the dirty dozen, uh, those 12 industries that are most, if you like, uh, got to move. Uh, to get to where we need to be. Uh, and then we are, our third report was on qualifying for the race to net zero. And that was particularly looking at the skills gap, not only in terms of those younger people coming out of school into the workforce, but also I think in our country, I think historically we've been pretty poor at retraining people while they're in work in order to make the transition either within their sector or into other jobs as well. And our most recent report was called Green Shoots, which was looking at how do you drive innovation uh, to get to net zero. So in the next few minutes, I'll maybe just touch upon a few of the outcomes from that. And I'm sure in the debate, we'll get to some answers, hopefully. First of all, I just wanted to say this as a sort of just, I like sort of things that paint picture. And one of the things the government like to do, and lots of people like to do, uh, is talk about how uh, we have reduced our emissions from 1990 to today by about 44%. That's great. Um, but the truth is, in that journey, it wasn't all about a strategic attempt to reduce our greenhouse gases. It was because we shut down manufacturing, we shut down industry. And so for a lot of those places, um, outside of our big cities, in those in towns and industrial communities, like the one I used to represent in Doncaster, where I still live, um, they saw uh, their industries decline, but also I'm afraid manufacturers seeing a cheaper source of labor elsewhere overseas. So they would get their products made there and then we'd re-import them back into this country at a far higher carbon potential uh, um, encompassing on them. And as a result of that, we have lost time, I think, in manufacturing to realize the sort of ways those industries have to change in agriculture as well, where actually we haven't looked at the sort of tech an investment that could have made, helped them move faster. Um, so yes, it's a good statistic and, and governments will continue to use it, but there is another story behind it, which has had a social and economic, economic cost. And if there is one thing that I feel passionate about to come out of this transition, this journey that we are on, is the opportunity to, in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same for other countries as well, to rebalance our economy economically and socially to make it fairer. And there are challenges, but actually there are real opportunities uh, there as well. So we know that the poor regions of our country uh, depend more on carbon intensive jobs. Two in five jobs in UK's poorest regions uh, are rely on high intensive jobs. And in London and the Southeast, we have the lowest proportion of jobs in that sector. In the East and West Midlands, in Yorkshire and Humber, in the Northwest, it's the highest number of jobs affected. And more than half of, uh, of the highly intensive jobs are in, and highly emitting jobs are in those um, regions. And of course, Scotland, let's not forget Scotland in that too. Now, uh, my constituency um, is a red wall seat. Others claim to be red wall, but that's a political discussion had. But actually in those constituencies in the red wall, that's where the battleground politically is going to be. So it's worthwhile as considering not only if you like the academic policy, but the incentivization for politicians to make change as well. And that's where the politics uh, kicks in. 43% uh, of workers in so-called red wall seats work in high emitting industries. Over 50% of the lowest decile constituencies by high emitting jobs are in London. 48% of the top decile of constituencies in high emitting jobs are in rural areas and towns. And, and actually this is important as well. Um, it's a lot easier for cities. Uh, they've got a much more diverse labour market. They have proportionally fewer high emitting jobs. They have the transport infrastructure already. I've come down to London <laughs> for this and a few other things. And I constantly, you know, it is amazing the transport infrastructure we have. So forgive me if I get a bit weary of Londoners moaning about it. And I was born in London. Um, it is a big issue. Uh, for those communities in the rural areas and smaller towns. When we did our Greening the Giants report, which looked at those 12 industries that make up two thirds of UK carbon emissions, um, you know, there are some right steps happening, but it is slow still. It is slow. And many of them are not on track, let alone to get to 2050, um, um, uh, to, uh, let alone to get to 2025. So 
those 12 industries that range from aviation, agriculture, waste, transport, construction, they represent 23% of UK output and 21% of current jobs. And disproportionately, those jobs are in these areas that I've already uh, mentioned. And in those areas, in terms of the value they get from those jobs economically, it is places um, like uh, the East Midlands, Scotland and Wales that are more at risk and more exposed. In qualifications, we also know that in the high intensive jobs, actually the average qualification level is far lower than it is in the sort of net zero uh, jobs that are there. And we also know that the gender pay gap is more considerable, I have to say, in high emitting jobs than it is in um, the net zero area too. But again, there's opportunities here if the government can grasp them to change those jobs. But we've got a problem. Um, let me just leave one example here before we, we go on. There's always a lot of talk about heat pumps. <laughs> there was a lot of talk coming out yesterday on heat pumps. I suppose on one level we succeed when people are so bored of hearing heat pumps, uh, the message is actually getting through. But um, here's something for you to leave you on. 600,000 installations we need each year uh, to get to the target where we need to be. We're not even close to that for 2015, let alone for um, 2028. Um, the national rollout is 27 million homes. Now here's something to think about and for those watching us today. We now have 1,200 plumbers in the UK capable of installing heat pumps. So if the 1.67 million annual sales of gas boilers were replaced by heat pumps, that would mean we'd have to have those plumbers installing four a day, 365 days a year for God knows how long. That is just one example of the training challenge we have here. And along with that is the lack of investment in construction and transport and elsewhere in terms of uh, research and development. And also still, which I think you were talking about, the lack of incentives that are still there that enable considerable foreign investment to come in and allow us to be you know, first stage ma major players in this area. And all of those things are important. Sorting out the benefits that are paid to people on the poorest incomes and getting their homes done but you've got to create the jobs and the wealth in the economy to take those communities forward. Well, that is a perfect jumping off point for the question that I'm dying to ask. And then I, I, there's, I know there's lots of questions waiting to come in. But Polly, if I can bring you in, we've talked a lot about what, we, what could be a just transition, but what's a green job? Do we even know? Caroline's talked about carbon intensive jobs, but what makes a job green? Well, I, I think there is a lot of uh, discussion about that, actually. Um, it depends what uh, it depends uh, really on um, a, a range of things. I think importantly, we need to be start thinking about transitional skills so that we are thinking about the people who are in those energy intensive industries, those dirty dozen that, that Caroline mentioned and how the skills they've got, how transferable they are, supporting those people to be able to repurpose those skills and understand what that means for the kind of jobs they will have at the other end. But also identify um, what you might do to be able to tackle some of the other underlying trends that Caroline has pointed out, um, that means that, that, that that's gonna be more difficult. The fact that it is in, that quite often you're talking about this these being in, um, in small towns um, and outside of, of cities. So actually, somebody said to me, oh, don't worry if this, this, I'm sure Caroline will find this is annoying as I did. Somebody said, oh, you know, women will be in a really good place uh, in the, the net zero world because lots of the jobs that women do as caring jobs, they're, they're low carbon. And I was like, well, listen, mate, you've not been a social worker having, or, or a care worker having to drive um, like the clappers between uh, appointments because you've only got 15 minutes in order to be able to look after somebody, probably using quite a lot of single use plastics in the meantime, and not actually having to not having time or anything to think about what kind of car you use, or what, or, you know, what kind of food you provide or any of those kind of things. So there are some, it's, it's actually transforming those kind of jobs which are actually fundamental to our economy, a service industry and so forth, will be the kind of thing that a lot of people are not yet thinking about because they are concentrating on the fossil fuel uh, end of it. And I think that's right. Um, I think also um, that it's important to remember that you can't replace a miner in Mansfield with a hipster in Hoxton and say that's the same thing. You have to make sure that you have got a program of transformation for Mansfield and its people if you are going to deindustrialize. And that's the tragedy of the last 40 years is that those that, that deindustrialization 
has not come has not been accompanied with a proper kind of reskilling and a focus on manufacturing in particular because we're going to need to have shortened supply chains you know if you are if you you can still be making stuff but if you're making stuff that is sold closer to where you are that's a greener job than something that is actually being um, uh, Im uh, imported from across the world. So, so there's so loads of different can, things that will make it difficult. So if I can bring you in, I've been rather like a stuck record. I was in Denmark last week. <laughs> I've said this several times already today. Uh, and I'm going to pin you down a little bit. I met a, I met a plumber who was installing a heat pump and I met a car mechanic who was had retrained. He paid for his retraining, but he'd got it subsidised, I think, uh, to, be, to be able to work on electric cars. How has that transformation happened there? And are there lessons that can be applied in this country? Well, I think what, what's important to note about uh, Denmark is that there is a, a, a growing and now I would say very big consensus politically uh, around the need for a, an urgent green transition. So, so from left to right <laughs> in the political spectrum, uh, there, there is widespread su support for uh, even quite uh, radical and ambitious uh, climate policies. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that consensus sends a very important signal uh, to the market, both at the labor side and the employer side, that, that, that this, is, this is the direction Denmark is heading into, whether you like it or not. And you can run out of business if you don't invest in new technologies. And if, as a worker, you don't make sure you are upskilled um, uh, so that you can provide those new technologies that are now becoming much more widespread, you, you might find it more difficult to find a good and, and, and a well-paid job. So I think we are seeing this massive consensus. There's another interesting thing though, because this, this is the same thing for Denmark as in the UK. In many Global North countries, we've been effectively uh, exporting our emissions mm -hmm. over the past decades. And you could even argue that, that this is the same for cities in, in relation to more rural areas. Because it, it used to be that cities, that's where you found industries, but, but since the 80s, uh, maybe even since the 70s, we've seen that that industry uh, has moved out of cities. And of course, that has an impact on emissions. But I think cities are also showing what needs to happen in, in, in order to, to get a, a fairer and more, you could say, accurate picture of the emissions that you're responsible for in cities because lots of cities again that are part of the c40 network they are now looking at their total emissions they're looking at the emissions from goods and services capital investments you could say consumed within the city but 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 produced outside the city and when you do that 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 gives you a whole new range of 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 uh, analysis where you get a much more accurate image of what is it really we are responsible for in a city like Copenhagen in terms of emissions. But it also means that new policies and really efficient policies can come out of that. For example, policies that leads to, okay, so the, the industry we do have, how can we work with that industry to, to, to green it, to green the giants, so to speak. So I think making sure that, that, that when we're measuring carbon emissions, we are doing it in a holistic way where we're also looking at our consumption, not just the production within our, our boundaries. I think that's that's essential. One more question from me before we take questions from uh, everyone who's listening uh, and relating to this to, to both Caroline and Jude. When we think about then the sort of changes, whether it's a just transition, whether it's uh, the kind of steps that cities and towns could make that Simon's describing, how important is local leadership? We heard quite a lot in the previous session about the need for there to be much stronger devolution, much stronger local leadership. Karen, how, how important is that? Yeah, I think it is important, but I think they have to be accountable as well. I'd like to see regional carbon budgets and whether that's under local authorities or our mayoral system here in the UK, uh, you know, you, you've got to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. I would do all retrofitting. I would devolve that to a more local level and also electric, electric vehicle infrastructure as well. I think it's better placed at a local level. But there has to be accountability as well. And that's why, you know, you, the national oversight is to bear down on what is actually happening in those areas. Uh, so we make the progress we need to make. A lot of local authorities have got, <laughs> they've got plans. I think if you interrogate some of those plans, um, they not, might not be all that we might want to see. Ryan, I mean, you, if, if you're going to have local bonds in the way you were describing, that's going to take some local leadership, isn't it? Yeah, I think local leadership is absolutely key. But what we see is that they don't necessarily have the powers to do that right now. And again, I've heard you go on a couple of times, but they put out um, their community talking about net zero local powers and a bill for that. You need to be able to make 
local leadership accountable for it, as Caroline has just said. But also, it's hard to compare different regions across the country. So if you're looking at it from a national perspective, you need to give them the powers, give them the funding to go alongside it, and build up standardization so you can measure it. Um, just going back to the point that you were making, I just want to say that political leadership is absolutely key with all of this. If you look at what's happening in the USA at the minute, Joe Biden came, came out with this $2 trillion infrastructure plan. It's a fantastic plan. And my favorite part in it was the Just Transition Fund, where they were going to target retraining for coal workers. And what we've seen in the last couple of days, we've seen Joe Manchin in West Virginia come out and block this in the Senate. You know, the reasons for blocking it, we, we can look at the bad faith arguments he's making. But what that means is that the he tens represents of thousands, a, an area with lots of coal workers. But there are tens of thousands of coal workers there that the plan would be retraining. By blocking the retraining, in 10 years' time, where are they going to be? And that's the, we need to look at long term political leadership on this. Mm. I'm going to take a question um, from Richard Nelson, who's watching on Zoom. He says, food security is essential and importation is costly, creating a trade deficit. Food that's fresh and local can build the health and wealth of communities. But technologies aren't adapt adopted, sorry, aren't adopted because of corporate control by food system and vested interests working to maintain a system of consumerism. Food is also a great opportunity for the reduction of the CO2 footprint of this industry. Why aren't you talking about food? Who wants to take this on? Simon, why aren't we talking about food? What did you have for lunch? Nothing. <laughs> so. Well, well, I, I won't talk about my lunch. Uh, it was fine. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think food is certainly a topic that, 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 that we should talk about. And the interesting thing is cities are talking about it. Um, in the C40 network, I've mentioned a few times, uh, close to 100 of the largest cities in the world, they have a very uh, efficient food network where close to 50 of those cities are, are, are uh, you know, exchanging best practice with each other. How can they work with their food systems to make sure that they're reducing emissions from, from the consumption of, of, of meals within the city? And a city like Milan is a great example. They actually have a program where they are trying to make sure that the, the meals they're serving in their schools, for instance, that, that lots of that produce is coming from local producers. Mm -hmm. And that way you make sure it's seasonal and it's local. You reduce the, the need for transportation. It also tends to be healthier. Uh, and and they ca it can be integrated in, in programs. So the, the students are also learning about you know, food and, and healthy nutrition and so on. Um, and and, and we're seeing lots of other cities taking inspiration from programs like that. The meals they're serving themselves, whether it's in the homes for the elderly or to the, to the, the children in school, that's really where they're starting. And by that, they can influence the market and it can grow from there and really, really gain scale. Polly, is food a difficult one when it comes to politics? You're asking for behaviour change. It wasn't something that was uh, discussed in the Net Zero strategy yesterday. Uh, is it a tough one for to sell politically? Oh, we're not hearing you, Polly. Sorry, I unmuted myself. No, it depends. Um, I, I agree. It depends what um, I'm being sen I'm sensible. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, it depends what you're, what you're asking people to do. And I think Simon's completely right. The, the key thing is for local leaders, and this goes to the points about accountability and democratic, uh, democratic, uh, democratic accountability and leadership, is that people, um, people who have got that power and authority need to use that power and authority to demonstrate the direction of travel. So use your procurement powers to do exactly like Simon says about the, the food that you provide in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, services that you are providing to make sure that you can say that we're doing this differently. Then work with your local private sector to be able to see what you can do differently. We have a countryside climate network as a, as a sub network of UK 100 where we convene, um, those, uh, local leaders outside of the cities. Who particularly get immediately focused on what this means for the going getting to net zero, what it means for their agriculture industry. And I say, yeah, of course it means something for your agriculture industry, but that's the thing that you've probably got least influence over when actually what food you provide and what food you commission for uh, for your for your various services is a key thing of sending a sending a signal and that will enable you to be able to find other allies and build support because the last thing people want is to be told what to do what you actually want is to make it as easy as possible for them to do the right thing and that is a key part of local leadership which can really make a difference 
And I want to come back, and it does tie up with this conversation, something that came up when you were all speaking at the beginning, it came up this morning, um, this idea of resilience versus efficiency. There are lots of people, I think Ian Golden was talking about it this morning, uh, a lot of how we have lived in recent decades has been about efficiency. The pandemic has taught us perhaps we need to be resilient. How does that fit into the idea then of a just transition? Well, I, I think if you've got the opportunity to create goods and food is the question that we're looking at overseas, bring it in when you don't have as many controls, maybe on to, I used to be a public health minister. So I always find my life is overlapping all the time with different things I've done. Um, you know, in more recent years, we've challenged salt, sugar, fats and what have you. And again, that is really important. It's because to be honest, regardless of, dare I say it, net zero, the way we eat is killing us. Um, and our obesity crisis in this country and that, you know, people are not living or if they are living, they're living with long term conditions is substantially about food and other lifestyle choices. But the choice, what do people have in terms of choice? And that is part of the problem. And is it affordable, the healthier options that they need? Now, it seems to me part of it is if we're serious about this, it's not about closing the doors to imports into the UK but it's making better sense of what we produce here. And agriculture and the food industry is one area where if we're asking them to make changes, changes to provide more healthier food, more meat alternatives, then we have to stop in some ways or restrict or expect them to pay more those imports that are coming in that saturate the food market that actually don't make sense to our food producers here to engage in this debate. And, and you could apply that to manufacturing and other areas of our economy. If we want us to do the right thing here, then the people in the manufacturing sector, whatever it may be, food being one of them, need to think that actually what they're doing is appreciated and supported and they won't run at a loss. Ryan, though, thinking about how you fund a just transition, if the choice is, is often between resilience and efficiency, efficiency is often cheaper. That's why we choose it. It's, it's better in some sense. Resilience may be more expensive. How do you convince markets, governments, taxpayers that it's worth paying for resilience? Well, it's necessary. And whenever I talk about private finance, it's always what can governments do? They can give long-term policy certainty. If you direct where the, where the um, route of direction is going, then private capital will follow because they will know that they will need to adapt point you were just making there about importing and putting a cost on it. This is where economy-wide carbon pricing comes into it. Exactly. You need to make polluters pay. If the manufacturers are polluting, if they're importing it, if you add that onto the costs, then suddenly they'll be priced out of the market by local produce. As more people buy locally, the costs will come down locally and that will become more viable. So there are definitely levers that can be pushed. I've, I've oversimplified it there, <laughs> but this can be done. We just need the leadership. It needs to be long-term signals to the market. It's interesting, you're all nodding, but I mean, carbon pricing is still quite controversial in the way you're describing it. It, it is quite controversial. Um, I highly recommend reading the Zero Carbon Commission's report about carbon pricing, where it's economy-wide, but the most important part, if you're going to design it, is to protect those on the lower income deciles. So, And the biggest question that often members of the public say um, is, why are we having to do all this? Why are we having to make the changes when they're not doing it in another part of the world? Now, I always feel that it's all, and some politicians say that as well, I have to say. My view is if we don't do it, it's going to be the nightmare. We have to do this. Mm. But it's fair to say, if our, if our employers in different sectors are making these changes and looking at ways to change, then that should be rewarded. So I see it as a reward for those, but also just trying to incentivize with sticks and carrots to do the right thing. And it is not fair on our producers here if they're meeting all the things in terms of welfare, climate change and everything else in the food industry, if they're undercut time and time again by those imports coming in. I'm gonna put my PR person hat on for a moment. I'm not a PR person, obviously, but this idea then of a just transition, is it actually a very important idea both to define and to in a way sell to the public for them to accept some of the harder parts of climate change that undoubtedly are going to be there, the higher costs, the fact that you may have to, when your boiler packs up, may have to ditch it for a, a more expensive heat pump, say, to come back to heat pumps. Well, there has to be, uh, it can't be a one size fits all. We have to address those people who are least able to be part of this journey. And you know whether it's a boiler scrappage scheme, whether it's removing VAT on something like heat pumps to zero rated, obviously we've got to, we've got to have the workers to put them in as well. Mm. But the other thing I think with the public, there will be some people who shouldn't pay because of their economic situation, but even those who can afford to pay something, 
I think one of the things that is stopping them is their lack of trust in where we're going. And look, most of us who have a boiler in our homes, we wait until it breaks down to get another one. It's a big investment for a lot of people. And when they make, when they reach that point where that happens, they have to be assured that the companies who are trying to sell them a heat pump or whatever else it may be, are reliable and they can confidently put their money into that. As well as maybe down the way having some sort of uh, an incentive by government to help with some of the costs, if not all of the costs. Just, just on heat pumps in particular, um, it's not just certainty for the consumers on where it's going, but also the, the companies that are doing the training. I spoke to heat pump trainer, um, heat pump installers where they've said that they can't pay some of their staff to retrain to install heat pumps, because once they do it, what's the point? Because they don't know where the demand is going to come from. It was great to see the grants yesterday at five grand, but the average person, if a heat pump is still around seven, eight K, does not have that remaining amount of money. So that grant should have been accompanied with 0% interest loans to cover the rest of it for people at the middle income level. Mm. For people in the lower income level, it should be being paid for by government, by local governments. And this is where the carbon pricing ring fence revenues would help them. For those at the other end of the scale, the able to pay market, we need to incentivize them with these loans as well. So there's, there's no silver bullet. There's plenty of policies that need to come in together here. We are almost out of time. Holly, I'm going to ask you one last question that's come in. What do you think local leaders can do to engage citizens in the just transition? Well, it's not just about engaging them. It, uh, the first and most important thing is they need to do is to demonstrate their own commitments. That a lot of them will have declared climate emergencies. And like Caroline says, a lot of them have got plans, but then understanding how they're going to deliver them is a, di is a different issue. Ryan mentioned our power shift report, which is a comprehensive analysis of all the powers that local authorities have got that can be used in order to be able to meet net zero and the limitations that there are on those. So that's a really good handbook for anybody who is interested in what local government can do in order to be able to think, oh, OK, there are powers that can be used in this way, things on energy efficiency, things on planning and procurement in particular um, are the ones that I, I keep banging on about because they come they're quite often not the ones that people think of because they actually are right at the heart of your political strategy. Um, so understanding that. But the, uh, but the other thing is um, what was acknowledged in the um, in the report yesterday is that local in the strategy yesterday is that local government has influence over about 30 percent of emissions within it uh, within their own uh within their own borders as it were so that means that there's 60 percent so, sorry 70 percent which they're at which are is out of their control except that it's not that is where the power of convening of a local authority to bring public and private sector together, the universities, the major employers, the businesses, the residents and the, the civil society together and say, right, we've declared a climate emergency as a, as a council, but we as a community have to solve this problem and it will involve all of us. And that's where you can have some real uh, game changing opportunities for conversations. But they must use all of the powers they've got before they start telling other people what to do. Holly, we must leave it there. Really interesting conversation. We could have gone on for ages, but I think uh, lots of support uh, for more local powers and uh, lots of support for the idea of the, the importance of a just transition. Thank you very much to everyone. Polly Billington, Simon Hanson, Ryan Jude and Caroline Flint.